<clears throat> well, once again, uh, my thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, this is the Evelina London Children's Hospital where uh, I've been working for the last few years. So this is part of a talk that I gave on uh, transposition of the great arteries and uh, it was first described by Matthew Bailey as a simple uh, defect. Uh, but as we know, of course, it has many manifestations and in particular may be associated with obstruction to the left ventricular outflow tract. And this obstruction may be uh, situated either subvalvar or with accessory tissue prolapsing through the VSD or the valve itself. And you can see here we have obstruction in uh, at A, which is simply some deviation of the outlet septum. In B, there's more deviation. C, it's associated with extreme deviation and some dysplasia of the, of the pulmonary valve. D, the pulmonary valve is really quite severely dysplastic. And in E, that uh, the whole LV outflow tract is uh, dysplastic and narrowed. And finally, in F, there's an associated straddle of the tricuspid valve across the ventricular septal defect, which is sometimes seen. So those are the possible causes, the dynamic shift, etc. we've talked about. So the surgical intervention options, of course, are those determined by presentation. Many of the cases will be picked up uh, in fetal echo, which enables uh, plans for delivery and uh, some anticipation of the likely treatment. Uh, if there's thought to be very severe outflow tract obstruction, then of course prostaglandin may be required. Uh, but if prostaglandin is required, the options would be probably to do a Bl blaylock tysic shunt in the first instance, or these days some of our cardiologists would prefer a ductal stent. It's a matter of of institutional and uh, individual preference. If it's isolated to the pulmonary valve, then it may be possible to balloon the outflow tract in the pulmonary valve. But sometimes the cyanosis associated is actually a consequence of poor mixing as in other forms of transposition. So many of these cases will in fact benefit from a septectomy or septostomy alone. And the contraindications really to considering a biventricular repair may well be a remote ventricular septal defect or a straddle of the atrioventricular valves. So it's very rarely associated with an intact ventricular septum, but where it is, a sending operation combined with a degree of, of resection may be appropriate or a sending with an LB to PA conduit or arterial switch and resection. If there's a ventricular septal defect, which is the most usual situation, the options are the Rastelli operation, Nakairo, Rev, or arterial switch with resection, and some others which I'll mention briefly. But the mainstay of the operation of the operative treatment is the so-called Rastelli operation, and here we can see just a little schematic of it. Uh, with a patch that is placed in such a way as to channel the left ventricle through the ventricular septal defect towards the aorta, and then a conduit is placed from the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries to establish the biventricular repair. But the real problem with this uh, situation is the dog leg that uh, exists between the outflow from the left ventricle and the aorta, which is completely committed to the right ventricle. And here you can see the left ventricle, the VSD, a cut across the right ventricle and the aorta. And so it's fairly obvious straight away that the outflow tract from the left ventricle will be dominated by firstly the size and, sh and shape of the ventricular septal defect and the pathway created by the patch and this muscle that I've marked as obstructing muscle of the outlet septum is a major player. Unfortunately, does not con uh, contain the conducting tissue, so can theoretically be safely resected. But I say theoretically because just behind that and above it, 
are the arterial valves. The pulmonary valve, of course, doesn't matter too much, but the aortic valve can very easily be damaged if you're not careful. But the Rastelli has been around for a long time in the early six, in the mid 60s when Rastelli himself described the operation. And here is a series of 100 cases uh, published from Boston in 2000. And the top slide shows the overall survival with the confidence intervals. And you can see that out of 20 years, there's about a 60% survival. So, you know, 60% is very good for those who've survived, but that we must bear in mind that there are 40% who didn't. And the survival by era, though it appears in fact, has not changed greatly if we look at the lower graph. But a major uh, associated problem with the Rastelli operation is the frequency of re-intervention. And here we can see that at 20 years, virtually all patients will have had to have some re-intervention on the right ventricular outflow tract, and a not insignificant proportion will have had some re-intervention on the left ventricular outflow tract. And so this adds up to quite a lot of further surgery within the 20 years following the operation. And when you calculate the two things together of either death or freedom from reoperation, about 10 to 20% of patients may be free of either, which is pretty low and, you know, somewhat depressing really for an operation. Now, just here are further MRI scans, which uh, demonstrate the, uh, the the problem in the le uh, upper left. You can see the the dog leg from the LV to the aorta, and the uh, 3D reconstruction will show also the flattening of the conduit marked C between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. This conduit lies just behind the sternum, and on completion of the operation, many surgeons will admit that everything looks good. You've come off bypass, the heart is working well, you've got a good blood pressure, and when you go to close the sternum, suddenly everything changes because the conduit can be very easily compressed. It can be to some extent mitigated by displacing the conduit towards the left, but in many situations, uh, you still have a problem. So one option is to try and avoid the, the conduit being so far forward, but also, of course, the secondary problem, which we've mentioned already, is the difficulty of the left ventricular outflow tract, and hence the Nakaido operation has emerged as an alternative, and here the uh, aortic root is disconnected, and in a sense, it's a bit like a Ross operation. It is transplanted backwards, having removed the pulmonary root in order to create a more linear outflow tract. I don't seem to have a pointer, but you can see in the lower section a, a, a straighter pathway from the left ventricle to the, the, the what is the aorta. And of course, it is not the neo-aorta, it is the aorta, unlike in an arterial switch where the what becomes the aorta was once the pulmonary valve. It's a complex operation. It's extensive. I have to say I haven't myself done this operation because it is a rare indication. And recognizing that, I allocated one of my younger colleagues when I was the head of service to take this up and to, uh, to, to run with it and uh, to do the operation and to get good at it. Um, and happily, that seems to be the case. He's also been... Um, mentored through that by another of my trainees, Reza Hosseinpour, who's the chief in, in Seville. So I'm very pleased to see some of my trainees uh, helping one another for the good of the patient in the longer term. But here you can see how in B, the uh, aortic root is disconnected, and then behind that, the pulmonary root, which is effectively discarded. The aortic root is then dropped backwards to connect to the rim of the LV. The outflow tract, the VSD is closed, and then with a Lecomte maneuver, the pulmonary arteries are brought forward and connected to the right ventricle. The, it's a relatively, I would say it's not, it's not a new operation. It was 1984, but it hasn't caught on massively, but, those, but it is emerging uh, more, and I think perhaps as a consequence of the 
recognition of the problems of the Rastelli and other alternatives. And here we can see uh, the uh, survival follow-up uh, in some centers, and the top line represents the Nikaido uh, in the hands of, of uh, Ye and, and also uh, Victor Morel. But there's relatively short follow-up and small numbers, but encouraging. This is recent data from Boston, a total of 32 cases. And what they have looked at actually is the impact of the type of conduit used, but the survival over the course of the follow-up period, of, which extends to 17 years, is really very encouraging and certainly compares much better than the Rostelli operation. And then when they looked at the uh, freedom from re-intervention, it was very much dependent on whether a conduit was used or not. And where no conduit was used, which was only five cases, there was no intervention in the follow-up period. Otherwise, there was conduit change. So they simply used a transannular patch and in effect repaired it much the same as we might repair a tetralogy of fallow where we do not employ a valve conduit. The other alternative popular in France is the REV. I won't try and say it in French because it's I can't. I can't speak Greek and my French is a little better. But the principle here is somewhat similar to the Nikairo in the sense that a Lecomte maneuver is used to transplant the pulmonary root in front of the aorta. And then this, this outlet septum is resected <clears throat> to enlarge the VSD and to try and avoid this uh, LVR protract obstruction. And here we can see the VSD being closed. And then the uh, pulmonary arteries are, are connected to the right ventricle, generally without a valve conduit. So much the same uh, anatomy or uh, RV to PA uh, physiology as you would see after the Nakaido operation. And the follow-up, it has a reasonable uh, follow-up. Uh, the overall survival appears to be very good <coughs> in uh, quite a large series. But there is a, an event-free survivor which does not compare really any better than the Rastelli operation. Uh, again, I have not done the REV operation and its popularity is, is, as far as I can see, mainly confined to France. Uh, but it is certainly an option that has, has its place. <coughs> and here's just another uh, look at the event-free survival, the redo frequency and other forms of redo operation associated with it. <coughs> now there are other novel maneuvers and uh, instead of the uh, Nakaido operation, some patients will have a degree of pulmonary valve stenosis, which is not so severe. And if it was in isolation associated with a normally connected heart, would be treated either with balloon valvuloplasty or indeed may well be accepted. But as an aortic valve, that pulmonary valve would not be satisfactory. So an option is to do a complete on-block rotation of the conotruncal outlet. And this is an operation, again, I have, I've never seen it, but I know that uh, uh, one or two of the surgeons at Necker in, in Paris have performed this. It's clearly got a, a somewhat of a niche uh, but it does overcome the uh, problem of the LVI flow tract uh, obstruction associated with the Rastelli procedure. Having completely removed this block, the coronaries, of course, must first be excised and then re-implanted. And that's uh, obviously a potential hazard. But having removed the block, you get very good access to the left ventricle and any associated outflow tract obstruction, which can be safely resected before the, the block is then resutured in its rotated position and the VST <coughs> is closed. As we see here, it's always very nice to look at these diagrams because there's never any bleeding. But I know full well that in the real world this would not be the case. There's virtually no data associated with a follow-up of this operation, but it is one of the ways in which LV outflow tract obstruction with transposition and VSD is treated. And here is another operative procedure, which is described by De Silva, the same man as who uh, popularized the cone procedure for Epstein's anomaly. And again, 
the pulmonary route is excised and then brought forward, having closed the VSD in the manner of a Rostelli procedure and attached to the right ventricle and connected this position. This, uh, he has, it describes a reasonable series, but it has not caught on. And that always makes me suspicious that either he is an exceptional surgeon who's able to achieve things that others cannot, or that the operation is not as reproducible as is claimed. But here is a series of 44 with a very good survival of 90% uh, out of 12 years and a very good uh, or a very acceptable reintervention rate at just, uh, at just about 20%. So uh, perhaps it deserves more consideration than we have given it. What also he has shown is that the pulmonary root appears to grow in parallel with somatic growth and that the gradient does not significantly increase in the great majority of cases over time, which of course is a very, uh, very good feature. So back to what we showed at the beginning, uh, Von Arstel and colleagues from Toronto published a very nice sort of what to do in the context of TGA, VSD and LV alpha tract obstruction. So here we see A, with mild posterior deviation of the outlet septum and a normal pulmonary valve, and their recommendation would be for an early arterial switch operation and possibly some muscle resection where there is a bit more severe posterior deviation on a normal pulmonary valve. Again, they recommend an arterial switch with muscle resection as the primary procedure. If there is more severe thickening of the left ventricular outflow tract with a degree of pulmonary valve hyperdysplasia, they suggest that there should be a consideration of a late arterial switch combined with muscle resection and perhaps also a pulmonary valvuloplasty. However, if there is severe pulmonary valve dysplasia, their recommendation is for the Rastelli procedure. In the context of a diffusely narrow left ventricular artery tract combined with a dysplastic pulmonary valve, their suggestion is for the Nakaido operation. And finally, in association with straddle of the tricuspid valve, that there should be a Fontan procedure. I cannot dispute any of that. And I'm sure that Matthew Bailey would be amazed to see what has become of the condition that he described all those years ago and which still represents a major challenge. And when there are so many operations for a condition, it's quite clear that no one has properly worked out what the real treatment <coughs> should be, and neither have I. Anyway, I thank you for your attention.